Christoph Jensch is the founder and CEO of Slocket, and he's a physicist by training. He's been working on, the, on Ethereum since 2014 as a lead tester, and believe it or not, he has five kids, the sixth is on the way, and he's going to tell us today how and why you should connect your IoT devices to the blockchain. Please help me. Welcome to the stage, Christoph Jensch. Thank you for coming. I'll bring you a... Thank you very much. Just one sec. Sure. Yeah, thank you for having me. So just waiting for my little device. But we have had some interesting discussions so far about different kind of blockchains, Bitcoin, Ethereum. So my background, yes, as he said already, is um, Ethereum, where I worked on since summer 2014. Then later um, started my own company. We are maybe most known for the project called the DAO, which is a longer story, which we don't have time to talk to today. But today I want to talk to you about how to connect devices, IoT devices, to the blockchain and why. So we start with the why, the non-technical part, and the later part will be a bit more technical. So there is a revolution which has started that we have billions of IoT devices, and of course billions of humans, and we are starting to connect more and more. As, as you are here at the CBIT, um, you see all of those things being developed um, in au autonomous cars, for example, where you want to interact with. Or um, we have examples like wearables, drones, you saw a lot of them here, smart factories, 3D printers, vending machines, supply chain, you have heard about use cases before, simple data sensors, especially the connected car and also smart homes. Everything is becoming more and more smart and connected to the internet. So that's the reality we are already seeing. And interaction with machines as humans comes on different levels. So one, there is a human-to-machine interaction. And this is like a human buying three nights of accommodation from a smart door lock. That's something we have already developed. You can download our app in the App Store, where someone can pay a device to give him access. So a smart door lock, a smart bike lock, a smart power plug, a smart car. You pay, and it grants you access. That's something we see already happening. Then there's another thing called machine-to-machine -machine transactions, where one machine is paying another machine. So you could think about an autonomous car needs to pay for parking, it needs to pay for toll collection, um, it needs to pay for charging electricity, and many other things. It could be a drone paying for its electricity, or a machine paying for a 3D printer to get some parts. So this economy of things is just getting started that we will see a new way of interacting. And this needs to be based on an infrastructure which is secure and which is not just run by one company and is highly interoperable, meaning they can work together. Another one is machine-to-human connections. We actually just recently had a request from a company, um, which is a company cleaning apartments, and they say, why couldn't be our cleaning stuff paid by the smart door lock once they clean the apartment? So only if they actually show up and clean something, then they get a payment. Or let's say an autonomous car needs to change its tires. It's going to the garage or to the service, and it's paying those guys to change the tires because there is no human to do any um, payment. So this is a future which is a bit more far ahead, but will also become a reality once we have more autonomous machines interacting with us. But the current ma machine economy is very fragmented and unsafe. First, machines don't have wallets. This means they don't have digital cash. So they cannot really interact on an economic level. Then you have usually the choice between either you're very secure, you're basically closing your system, not connected to anything, no IoT cloud, no third party applications, just you, and you are closing yourself down. Or you open yourself up, you integrate into IoT Cloud, third parties, and a lot of apps, but then you're highly insecure because you're basically giving the key to the device to someone else, and he can give it to someone else, and so on. So that's the current dilemma the IoT world is in. So you have those high security risks. Blockchain can solve a lot of those problems. Not everything, but blockchain can give wallets to machine. Like, people get bank accounts, company get bank accounts, but things don't get bank accounts, like my car won't get a bank account. So that's why it needs a wallet, and it can have one on a blockchain. You get a distributed standard where everybody can agree on, because it's not a standard provided by one company, it's a blockchain which everybody can connect to. You get the security of the blockchain and transparency. But there's still a big problem. How do you actually connect an IoT device to the blockchain? 
it's actually easier to write to the blockchain than to read from the blockchain. Simply because writing just means you store a public private key pair, or just a private key, and sign something and send it to a node connected to the blockchain. That's how you write to it. You need to pay a little bit of money for this, but it's easy. But if you want to read from the blockchain, this means you need to verify the chain, meaning synchronizing it. You, can, you could run a full client synchronizing the whole chain. For Ethereum, this will need about 400 gigabytes. If you run the pruned full node, which is all you need, actually, it only needs about 40 gigabytes and a lot of bandwidth and CPU power. So way too much for any IoT device. So then there are light clients. And usually we thought of this is the solution. Light clients, um, they only synchronize block headers and not the whole blockchain itself or don't execute all the transactions. They still need 50 megabytes, which is for some IoT devices, it's OK. But the bigger problem is, they are always part of this peer-to-peer -peer network. They're communicating, sending around transactions, sending around blocks. So you have a high requirement in bandwidth. That's why this, it's unfeasible for many IoT applications. So what people move to is they just say, let's just use a remote client. So basically, there's a server. The server tells you what you need. But then the whole point of blockchain is gone because you again have a single point of failure. If there's a man in the middle attack or the server is down, the system stops working. So you don't want to have this. So how do you solve this problem of having a trust-free or trustless access to a blockchain data without any intermediary, but also you do not want to run your own client or your own um, yeah, client in the peer-to-peer -peer network? So the solution to this problem is something we have worked on, and we are calling Incubed. Uh, it stands for Trustless Incentivized Remote Node Network. This means now you have not just one server, but you have a network of nodes where everybody can join and can say, I will now be a server for IoT devices. And then there's much more to it. How do you then make sure they are not lying to you or giving you correct data? And this is done the following way. This looks this is the most complicated slide, maybe, but I will take you through it. So you have those node A, B, C. There's just nodes of these networks which are delivering data to IoT clients. And what they are doing in a smart contract on any Ethereum-like chain, or you could say any blockchain, which is capable of running smart contracts, they pay a deposit. And this deposit is what they would lose in case they lie. So let's say I'm a node. I will pay 10,000 euro in Ether as a deposit to register there and saying, now I would answer requests from devices. So now as an IoT client or device, I would send an RPC request to one of those nodes in the list asking for, please get a signature from two distinct nodes, which I choose, let's say node A and C, and then give me the proof. That's called the Merkle proof, which comes together with the block header and the signed block hashes. That's all you need to verify the response. That's why we like to call this client also a minimal verification client. It does not synchronize the chain. It just verifies. And node A and C, they basically need to sign that this is the current correct response or the current block hash. This signature they give to node B, and node B gives it to the client. So there is no way to cheat for anybody here. And if someone would cheat and say, I sign a wrong block hash, then node B or anybody else could go to the blockchain and get his deposit directly from the smart contract. So there is no server running controlling the system. Nobody with no single point of failures, and everybody is controlling each other. That's the idea behind this. So we have a network of nodes checking each other's responses. If someone lies, they lose their deposit, and I, as an IoT device, can now connect to one of them. You still may ask, why should they do this? This is now the next thing. It, of course, needs to do a, ha have a payment in it. And we are using a micropayment micro -payment coming from the client to the node using state channels. We have, uh, today, we have heard um, a lot of sp things speaking about scalability. Scalability is the biggest issue we have right now in blockchain. We have heard some numbers, like Bitcoin can handle about seven transactions per second. Ethereum can actually handle around 20 transactions per second, which is still almost nothing. That's why people use private chains where they have higher scalability or higher tra transactions throughput, but this disconnects them from all the other chains. I personally believe that the solution to scalability lies mostly in so-called state channels or payment channels. I don't have the time today to explain you how they work, but it's global consensus versus local consensus, meaning you don't do everything on the blockchain. You just use it as a judge in case something goes wrong. 
So you, the blockchain is only used for dispute resolution. But in case everything goes right, you can have a local exchange of signed messages to make sure that yeah, you're not lying to each other and everything goes correct. So we are using payment channels or state channels to pay a microtransaction from the IoT device to the node. This can be fractions of a cent, and you can still do this because you only need to, like the, the only on-chain transaction are the beginning of a payment channel and the closing of a payment channel. Everything in between is more or less free. And you can pay every second, or you could imagine, for example, a, a car, electric car, stopping at a red, red traffic light, and it needs to get some energy, and it buys it from an induction um, system, which is underneath the street. And it pays per kilowatt hour or per second. And once it's done, it's just continue driving. Thus, those things are possible with payment channels. So I don't want you to read the code. I just want you to get a feeling of what a smart contract looks like. Because you're speaking about smart contract all the time. This, is, this would be the smart contract for the incubed system. So it's about 50 or 60 lines of code, usually pretty simple. And you only put the basic logic in there, defining how the system is run. And most of this is just setters and getters. The most important function is actually this. This is the function used if you found someone lied and had a wrong block hash. You can go to this function, convict him, and get his deposit. OK, this is about the technical part. Now, this gives us now an, another advantage. If you have such an incube client, which is not synchronizing a chain anymore, which is not storing blocks anymore, which is not storing the state anymore, it just removes all of this, the only thing you need is the actual software on it. This means you can now connect to several blockchains at the same time. So you have this multi-chain support. You can talk to the public Ethereum chain. You can talk to some consortium chains or private chains using the exact same code as long as this blockchain is EVM-based or Ethereum virtual machine-based. So this is now another huge, huge advantage you get from using an Incube client connecting to many chains at the same time. But this is just part of a bigger thing. We at Slocket, we are building the, the IoT layer because if you want to um, work with this, just connecting a device to the blockchain is maybe one of the most crucial steps, but it's not enough. You need more to, have, to build an application on top. So we have, uh, together with Raiden, we are using payment channels, as I explained, to do microtransaction. We have the Slocket Discovery to help you search and discover for devices. So you could say it's like a telephone book for IoT devices that they can subscribe and offer their services, and then people can pay to use them. And all of this is working without any central intermediary, because you can have a look in the blockchain which IoT devices are registered, are registered there. You see their interface, and you can say, well, they have an interface where I can pay to access, or they maybe have a whitelist where I can get on this list, and once I am there, I can use it for free. So whatever business model you have in your company, once you connect those devices, they are becoming part of this economy of things. So you, they can be paid on this level. And this kind of payments or virtual payments is something the IoT device itself can verify. It can verify that it did receive a digital payment. Otherwise, like in a couple of years ago, the only thing you could do is talking to the PayPal API or Visa or MasterCard API. Maybe you get a response, maybe you don't. And Maybe you even have a chargeback, and the money actually was never yours anyway. So you have no idea. So with digital money now, with Ether, Bitcoin, and all those um, coin payments, you actually can verify on yourself that you did receive digital cash. And then as a machine, can then do certain services, like grant access to someone. Also part of this layer are access control smart contracts. Sometimes, of course, I'm asked, what, is, what do you use the blockchain for? What are you using smart contracts for? If you read most of the smart contracts out there, 99% of them are doing nothing but permission management. Just saying, if you have this key, you can do this. If you have this key, you can do this. It's just managing who's allowed to do what, under which conditions, and which time. That's what most of the smart contracts are doing. And we are using smart contracts to say, we, are, we are program the permissions of those IoT devices. It can be based on a payment, you can do something, based on a whitelist, or based on something else. Because now we have something I also like to call programmable money, where you can code in how the money should behave and how it should um, affect accesses to IoT devices. 
When it comes to payments, we are supporting yes, Ether, ESE 20 tokens, Euros, Bitcoins, but we also have a Stripe integration, so you can even pay with dollars and Euros. Um, which of course, then you need to trust this integration or the company's Stripe, but I think we still have some time to go until we are only working with virtual currencies. Of course, important are the IoT cloud integration, messaging systems, I explained to you the multi-chain support, and IoT integration, what I mean with this is that we actually have images which go and like, often use boards such as the Raspberry Pi or the Samsung Arctic or other chip systems where you can deploy the solution directly. So this IoT layer now gives you the features that once you connect your IoT, device, IoT devices to these layers, you have this high interoperability, meaning everybody can connect to your device. And this is on a different level. Usually you speak about open APIs, about opening your system to someone else so they can connect to it. But an open API is nothing but a connection to your server, which may do something or may, may not do something for you. I like to call smart contracts direct APIs because you see actually how they behave. You can have a look inside this black box and see what will happen if I call this function and see if I get access or not. You get the security of a blockchain, meaning um, for your device to be hacked, there are only two ways. The blockchain has, has to be hacked, which is extremely difficult. Or another one is your private keys are hacked. But there is no single point you can attack to shut down the system. If you are today at a like, IoT cloud, such as the Samsung Arctic Cloud, IBM Watson, and many others, they are a single point of failures. If they shut down, if the admin has a bad day, or if the company goes bankruptcy, then everything is gone. Like you have, don't have any connections anymore. The system you have built stops working. And usually IoT systems are built to last for 10 or 20 years or even longer. So if you think about building a sy system which should hold this long, it should be reliable, then you want to build on top of an infrastructure where you can be sure it still exists in 10 or 20 years. And a blockchain is usually something you, you can never take down. When you saw this from all the forks happening with Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, or even Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, it's almost impossible to really take down a blockchain. So meaning as long as you have one which is working, your system will continue to work. So I explained you already single, no single point of failure. Also, there is no log into the system. Most systems today, they require an email and password, but this system, or most of blockchain systems, don't require anything except of public and private keys. Everybody can generate a key pair, key pair in their smartphone or their desktop and then interact with your system directly without any login or sign up. So full permission management means the permission of this IoT device are managed within a smart contract. Full payment support means um, you have pay as you use or pay to access. You have the transparency of a blockchain so you can see what's actually going on or which devices are up for usage. And an important point is the last one. Here it says app coin free. We talked a lot about business models before, and one very common business model in the blockchain is create a token or like a virtual currency and just require it to be used for your system. Meaning you can only pay with the token I build to use my system. So this would be like if Apple would say the only way to buy an iPhone or a MacBook would be to buy Apple shares and pay with those. That's usually what a business model you're seeing with a lot of ICOs today, generating tokens and using this as a payment. But I actually believe those tokens are maybe not the best way of paying because they are highly volatile, they're changing value all the time. So this um, solution is completely app coin free, meaning there is no token you need to buy in order to use the system. You may use to have an Ether or another token, which is the underlying blockchain you're using to paying transaction fees, but there is no extra token you need to use in order to connect your devices to it or use this product. I think this is something very important, and it's, it's much easier when you spoke, especially with bigger corporates, it's often difficult for them to convince them of buying a speculative coin in order to use some software or product. It's like you have to convince a company to invest in it before they can use the product. That's something we wanted to avoid with this Locket IoT layer. Here's our team. We are sitting in Midvida, which is about three and a half hours driving from here, or two hours down south from Berlin, close to Dresden and Leipzig. And yeah, we are happy to doing services for you, such as consulting or building projects on top of it. But 
I think the, the most crucial part is that we are now part of this revolution where blockchain is a revolution in the back end, not in the front end. We are trying to change very old infrastructure, how, what is used to run IoT systems on top. Because once we have billions of devices, we do not want one manufacturer to control them all. And that's why we build a system like the Slocket IoT layer to connect your devices to the blockchain. And I think we do have five minutes left um, for questions. So I think if you have some questions, please let me know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. Are there any questions right now? Right in the back. Thanks, Carl. A mic is coming towards you. Anybody else who has questions, just raise your hands and I'll memorize. Uh, so I have a question about the incubate system and uh, how can a IoT device make sure that the balance exists if it doesn't have a copy of the blockchain? So when you bootstrap an IoT device, you bootstrap in the software, you need of course to bootstrap it with the current list in the registry contract, meaning there may be all the servers which are currently listed. That of course needs to be bootstrapped in the device. Then it can connect to them and ask for an update on this list, like what is the current list in the registry contract to know some servers it can connect to. But if the question is completely legit, you always need some first point of contact to get this list of servers. That's right. I think this, this was your question, right? Thank you. Any more questions? If there are no more questions right now, I'm sure you're going to be around, right? Actually, I have to leave oh. right now. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> if you have to head out.